Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everyone. I'm Hamis Saeed, founder and CEO of Shahu Technologies. So just like all of you guys, I'm also very excited to learn agile and related technologies from the master himself, Sir Zishan Elias. Today, we will be talking about uh, agile methodologies and techniques. So I, I would like to formally introduce uh, Sir Zishan. And Mr. Zishan Elias uh, is founder of PSE, Pakistan Agile and Scrum Exchange. He has 20 years of experience and has worked with renowned brands. Currently, he is working with Siemens as an Agile coach. So we will be starting session in one or two minutes. So meanwhile, I would like to take a chance to introduce Shahu Technologies to all of you guys. Shahu is a technology company primarily focused to introduce innovation and technology in sectors where it is historically less prevalent, such that event industry. We are aiming to reshape event industry, making it more collaborative, opportunistic, inclusive, and tech-enabled. In a three-year journey, we have created a big impact in the event landscape of Pakistan. Besides that, Shahu Technologies has supported few new startups, and we are focused to make them a success under the umbrella of Shahu. Our startups include, but are not limited to, Printable PK, Fashion PK, Mahru, Student.io, and Hatch Agritech. The basic philosophy of all Shahu ventures is to help others foster entrepreneurship, leveraging sharing economy model, and last but not the least, to create a positive impact. So now, with no delay, I would like to request Sir Zishan Elias to kindly start the training session. So thank you very much for your precious time, and we are really looking forward for a great learning. Happy learning, everyone. Thank you, Hamid, for a very good uh, introduction and giving me the chance uh, and giving me the platform to talk to you guys and talk to our future entrepreneurs and leaders. So today we are going to focus on how Agile can help us in terms of um, startup and we will look into various things and we will do some activities as well to reinforce our learning. So just a brief introduction about myself. So as Hamid mentioned, I'm working in the industry for the last 20 years, mainly in IT, banking, and uh, digital media. But last 10 years, I'm working in Agile in terms of uh, different roles. Uh, I did the role of Scrum Master, Agile Coach, uh, Trainer, Instructor. So these are my different profiles. If you see, these are the organizations I worked with, and these are the credentials. Okay, so with this, I would like to invite you to go to menti.com and use this code 293095. I will open on the browser as well, which you can see here. So when you are on this link from your mobile device or your tablet or your computer, just try to answer what does Agile means? Like when you hear the word, or when you heard the word agile, what comes into your mind? There is no right or wrong, so feel free. You can answer more than once as well. You can send up to three entries. So feel free to add what you think agile means. Okay. So again, the code is listed at the top. So you need to go to menti.com and the code is 293095. So Hamid, I pasted the code in the chat as well. Thank you very much. So feel free to send your entries. There is no right or wrong. So we can look into this collaboratively and then we'll talk about this. Okay, we have few entries. So you can enter more than once. If you think there's more than one meaning, you can enter more than once as well. I hope the link is accessible to all of you and you are able to log in. So we have three responses so far. So some more are coming. 
So someone said quality adjustment, quick change approach, client feedback, project management method. So where we have more responses that um, text or the keyword will be more prominent. So it looks like we have more responses on project management method. That's why it is highlighting. So it will create a nice uh, cloud bubble for us. Okay. If your guys having any technical difficulties, please let us know on the chat. So Hamid will be able to help you as well. Osama is there as well, I think. Okay. So we have different, um, let's say understanding of different people. So someone said quick, Someone said incremental model, methodology, project management method. So let's see actually the definition which Google has provided us. Let's look on that. So if you search agile, it comes as able to move quickly and easily. So, and the second definition is saying is relating to or denoting a method of project management use especially for software development. So this, that is characterized by the division of tasks into short phases of work and frequent reassessment. So this is purely from the software point of view. As I said, so Agile, some people have different understanding. So what I would like you to see is this video. This video will give you a very good understanding what Agile means and how Agile can help startups or entrepreneurs or people with bright ideas to get their ideas to the market. Okay, I'm going to play this video. If it's not audible, please let me know. Agile, how would you explain what it means? Ask five different coaches and you'll probably get about seven different answers. In this video, I'm going to explain the essence of agility and you get to find out exactly what happened when I tried to explain it to an eight-year-old child. Harbour and welcome to Agile Bytes, tackling the world of agility one bite at a time. So it seems fitting to start this video series with a fundamental question. What exactly does Agile mean? A few weeks ago I was asked to explain what Agile meant by an eight-year-old child and I instantly found myself thinking of the old Einstein quote, and if you can't explain something to a six-year-old child, you don't truly understand it yourself. Once the mild panic had subsided, I figured this was my opportunity to put that theory to the test, and off I went. I started my explanation with animals, which I thought was a safe bet. I've yet to meet a kid who doesn't love animals. I asked the girl if she'd ever seen a bullfight on television, which she had. I explained that bulls are fast creatures, surprisingly fast actually, but they very, very rarely catch the melata, which by the way is the uh, red cape. I just learned that today too. I explained that while the bull is fast, it just isn't nimble enough to change direction once it gets going. So it ends up going really, really fast in the wrong direction, sailing right past the matador, unable to respond. She was with me to this point. I then asked her to picture a cheetah hunting its prey on the plains of Africa. The Thompson's gazelle twists and turns one way or another, and the cheetah responds easily. The cheetah doesn't know in which direction it's gonna be going, but it is designed from the ground up to be able to change direction quickly, easily, and with grace. That is what agile means. It's not enough to be fast, you need to be nimble. Now she definitely understood, but was a little bit confused about what that had to do with business. Uh, one step at a time, I guess. So let's bring this back to our context. In a world where you cannot know in advance exactly what's gonna happen, where there is too much volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity to plan in detail, 
detail, responding fast is the only thing you can do. That is the competitive advantage. Most organizations are designed like the ball. They line up in what they believe is the right direction and off they go. Fortunately, when they realize that they need to adjust, they're just not able to do so and they end up missing the target. On the other hand, some organizations are designed like the cheetah. They take a few steps, check they're headed in the right direction, course correct if necessary and continue. Because they are set up to make the small adjustments in flight, they end up hitting the target far more frequently. How can you not when you constantly seek and respond to customer and stakeholder feedback? Delighting the customer is the goal. Agility is the property which allows you to achieve that goal. So can you do agile? Well, can you do adaptive? Can you do responsive? That doesn't make any sense. You can be those things, they're adjectives. You can be adaptive, you can be responsive, you can be agile. To so ask yourself this, is your organization the bull, the juggernaut, the oil tanker, locked into a business case, locked into a scope, locked into a plan, unable to respond to developments? Is it speeding along in the wrong direction, unable to course correct? Or is it the cheater, zigzagging its way to the target, constantly checking and course correcting based on real customer feedback, responding to great new ideas and a constantly changing business climate, which is more likely to delight your customers. So there we have it, Agile Explained. Got a better analogy? Tell us all about it in the comments section. Right, okay, so we can turn on the microphones now. So if you have a um, question, you can ask. So my question to you guys is, you're working in different organizations, or some of you might be uh, owners or CEOs of startups or new organizations. How you see yourself? Are you a bull or a cheetah? Anyone? What you think? What you think of your organization? Your organization is like a bull or cheetah, based on what we have seen. Uh, as per my own understanding, uh, thing now, uh, it's a mix of both, I guess. Uh, it's more inclined towards the cheetah thing. Uh, but uh, we can say we have few characteristics of bull as well. Yeah, so, so bull is referred to the organizations, uh, like the, let's say large organization who are locked up into um, their ways of working and changing small things requires lots of time, lots of effort. And the cheetah, in my view, cheetahs are like new startups, the people who have these dynamic ideas and who are continuously changing their direction and shape. Let's say they worked on one idea and if that idea doesn't work, they can jump quickly on the other idea without making so much changes in the organization. So that's where I really like this video because this video tells you the essence, like why Agile is important for upcoming or new organizations, especially for the startups. Because if I take the example of bigger organizations um, who are very deep into their roots, even if they have to change something, they have to go through lots of stage gears, lots of processes, especially when you're working in the banking industry as well. But if you are a very FinTech kind of startup or a lean startup, then for you to course correct yourself, to pivot from one idea to another idea, it becomes very, very easy. So you need to see, you need to make sure how you get the feedback from the customer. And that's the whole reason we are having this session where we'll go into some details, like what are the tools, methods, or framework available to us, which will help us to course correct, which will help us to see how we can get better feedback from the customer. If one idea doesn't work, how we can quickly go towards the other idea, okay? And then if we talk about agility, as I said, so agility is a property of an organization to sense and respond to market changes and continuously deliver value to the customer. So we need to see or we need to think about our organization where we are working or we are, we are running the organizations. Do we have that property of agility? If not, then we need to think seriously about that, how we can sense and respond fast to the market and how we can make our organization agile. So with this, I'm leaving you guys with this one question. So you need to keep a note of this question, take a picture of this question because I will be breaking you in rooms so you will go into your rooms and you will ask as a group activity, what is the biggest risk developing a product? Okay, so this question you need to discuss in your group. In, you, in Zoom, there is a functionality where I can send you in separate rooms. Automatically, it will divide the numbers of people by groups. And then when you are in your groups, uh, I will give you five minutes to talk about this. What is the biggest risk 
developing a product. Okay, keep a note of this question and I will create a breakout rooms for you. So in total, we have 16 participants. So I will divide them into four rooms. So in each room, you will have almost four people. Okay. And I will give you, let's say six minutes for this activity. I'm just creating this. You're not able to see this, I think, on your screen. So I've now created the rooms. So stay on your Zoom link. You will get a notification to go into a room, accept that, and then you will be in the room and automatically I will pull you back. So the question you need to ask to yourself or in your group is what is the biggest risk developing a product? Okay, here you go. Uh, Muad, are you able to hear me? I have assigned you to group three. So you need to join that group in your Zoom. Muad Asif? You are assigned to group three.
Okay, so you guys are coming back. So we have one group back. We have three more groups to come back. Right, thank you for coming back, guys. So what was the outcome? So what you concluded, what is the biggest risk uh, developing a product, any product? Any uh, idea? Yeah, yeah, we decided actually like it's a client expectation. Uh, we, it's a risk, basic risk, and that, uh, we are not right target market. Uh, there are two voices, so one by one, guys, yes. Yeah, yeah. right target market and uh, client expectation. So client expectations. Yeah. So the client expectations, the reason you said is because it can change? Yes. Uh, during obviously, obviously this is the biggest risk. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any yeah. other uh, input? And the, and also we actually find out the, the you know, finance issue. Mm -hmm. Like in, in the, during the development risk is the finance, like and we cannot get the proper investor. Right. Okay. So it can affect the development of the product. Yes. Okay. Anyone else? Um, Bilal here. Jawad and I discussed that uh, the biggest risk, as this AJ brother said, is uh, regarding the customer. Uh, once the development starts, the customer might have some change of plans, and like the developer and the customer might have different mindsets, mm -hmm. might not be able to understand initially. So once the de uh, developed product is delivered, the co customer feedback and the customer satisfaction might not be there. That is the biggest risk. The second yeah. risk we discussed about was planning. I have seen a couple of uh, entrepreneurs uh, going for a product development, and later on they realized that the uh, their planning was not good, considering marketing, uh, considering financials. Later on, matlab, their, uh, the financials, unke jo hai, wo us tarah, like the AJ discussed financial I have I found a couple of uh, friends making an application and mm -hmm. then uh, realizing that they failed because they couldn't properly market it. So yes, yeah, exactly. Can. Very good points and very valid points. So I would like to mention um Urdu is your session. You need to make that session valuable. Urdu Urdu English English There is no hesitation. We are here in this together. Um, any other input from any other groups? So, so far I heard from two. What guys you had a, what guys, what you discussed about um, developing a wrong product? What is the biggest risk? Okay. So let's okay. see. Uh, I yeah. have, uh, we have a comment from Osama Ahmed saying, uh, being not able to build up a perfect team. So he says mm -hmm. that uh, not having a team is an issue. Yes, yeah, this is one of the valid reason as well. So if you don't have a motivated team around this, then you are not able to develop uh, good products and it can create lots of risk. Yes, good point. And I have a question also related, like uh, in the very start and putting the agile is it the process and we uh, our team is not uh, setting the mind of the agile. So it is very difficult. We are facing a lot of difficult in the startup uh, team. And uh, so this is the only challenge we're also facing. Yes. It's it's very valid challenge, and that's the, one of the reason we are doing this session to bring awareness. Uh, the people who are going into their own businesses, or they have great ideas, but they don't know where to start. Even if they know where to start, they end up with lots of different um, issues, problems, and risk. We need to see how agile can help us. What yeah. agile can do to bring th these problems to the surface. And one more thing, and one more thing, uh, I have to add on. Like we, if, if we are talking about the agile, we are mostly f uh, focusing on the tech side and software development side, and ignoring the other part, other processes like meta marketing operations and uh, the finance. So at the same process, obviously we want to implement in the marketing side as well in the operation side, which is very difficult to you know uh, implement all these processes. So this is the major challenge as well. Very valid point. Uh, we will talk about this in the later slides as well, where we'll see 
agile is more than just developing software. So the whole idea is to bring transparency, how you can make all these problems or all these tasks um, visible to all the team members, how you can capture all these things when you're working in a regular cadence. So we will come to that as well. So what I've seen so far is in, in my view, the biggest risk developing a product is to develop a wrong product. So this is the risk we, most of us faces. And some of you already have seen this picture on the internet, which is quite um, famous and being used in lots of presentations. So I, I like to use it here as well, which can give you a clear idea. Like in the first picture, you can see how the customer explained it. So customer initially said they want to have a swing hanging on the tree. And then it went to different, different people and everyone have their own understanding and they interpreted the information differently. If you see the programmer, he wrote it differently. If you see the business consultant, he understood differently and how the project was documented is differently and how the customer was built like a roller coaster where they were built very heavily. And then if you go towards the end of the project, then you see the expectation of customer is even changed. The, if you see the first picture, you see how the customer explained it. And then when the customer is reaching towards the end and he said, um, what I want is a wheel on the tree. So what the customer really needed. So if you look at this and if I ask all of you, who is at fault in this kind of situation? What you think guys? So how the customer explained and what the customer really needed, who is at fault? Is it the developer fault? Is it the business analyst fault? Is it the person who took the requirements or is it the person who wrote the requirement or, or who, who is at fault? Uh, I think uh, the project leader, because he has to be in very close sync with the customer. Mm -hmm. You know, if he's going to change something, the customer, uh, like he should be in close sync. So, yeah. Okay. So, uh, what's your name? I, I Sorry, uh, yeah, this is Jawad. Yeah. So, uh, Jawad, the said, business analyst who is at fault. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you are saying business analyst. So, we have two, two entries so far. So, one is because, saying... Uh, because business uh, developer and the project team, the okay. client, so you can say client and uh, yeah, he's a mediator. Okay. So now you are saying business analyst, anyone else, any other idea? Nobody, nobody's fault. <laughs> Only process, process no fault. Perfect. Perfect. So that's the answer I was looking for. So if you see here, so basically discovery changes understanding. So it's nobody's fault. It's not the leader's fault. It's not the business analyst's fault. It's not the development team fault. It is the nature of the work. As I showed you earlier, when customer is expl explaining you the problem or the requirement, at that time in stage of the work, they might be thinking something differently. But while you're working, things are changing and customer's expectation or sometimes customer understanding that say refines as well. So with this refinement, he say, okay, actually I didn't want this, I want this. So what we're saying is with discovery, so when we are working on the project, we are discovering or uncovering things. Discovery changes our understanding, okay? And, and the thing we need to careful about is there's a thing called cone of uncertainty. Uh, I will not go into too much detail about this. If you want, you can uh, Google this term as well, cone of uncertainty. So this is just to bring you in the context, like why there is, so much uncertainty. So this cone of uncertainty tells us whenever you start any new project, regardless of what type of project is, the uncertainty is usually very high. While you go towards the end of the project, your uncertainty becomes smaller. So that's the nature. But what we are doing in Agile or in the frameworks or methods within Agile is we are reducing those uncertainty in small time box activities. Okay. so. Let me try to annotate here, one second. Okay, so, so this is your, let's say, this is the timeline of your project. This timeline is running here. And you are working on, let's say, three months long project. And at the start, you don't know the unknowns. You don't know what dependencies project will have. So that's why you have this kind of uncertainty here. But when you're going towards, let's say the second or near to the third month at this stage, most of your dependencies or most of your uncertainties will be uh, answered. You will know exactly 
uh, what are the blockers, what are the things, and then you can communicate properly to the customer, and then at the end you will deliver. What we are doing differently in Agile is, imagine this is a big project. In Agile, when we are using increments or sprints, we are breaking these uncertainties into smaller portions, which is like this, like one to four weeks. So we are delivering every one to four weeks like this. So we are delivering, we are delivering. So what we are doing is we have broken this long project into small increments. With these increments, we have also reduced the uncertainty in the project, right? Because when we are working on this, let's say one to two week timeline, rather than working on three months timeline, we are breaking those stories. We are breaking those, let's say, requirements into smaller pieces. And within those sprints, we are getting customer feedback. We are designing, we are developing, we are analyzing, we are doing everything. And we are also getting continuous feedback from the team members as well. And if there's any dependencies or any issues, let's say if we started an agile project comparing to this waterfall project, in this waterfall project, if something has to go wrong, it will go wrong here. And then we will say, okay, now we are blocked. And sometimes customer will get very furious. Like he said, I have spent a lot of money into this platform. And now you are saying we need to spend more money into this. You're telling me right at the end of the project, Whereas when we are working in agile ways of working, let's say in uh, Scrum, in a fixed sprint, uh, we are into our first sprint and team has took some user stories. At this stage, they might raise some, let's say blockers. And at this stage, they might get fully blocked. So what Scrum does is, Scrum or any other method which gives you um, incremental delivery, it, they bring the problems at the surface. So Scrum is like your mother-in-law. If I give a, um, uh, context in in some fun. So it tells you the problem right at the start, right at the start of the relationship. So everything is visible to you. So you can make a decision. So your customer or your client can make a decision here. Either they want to go forward or they want to stop there. So this, this is another beauty of working in agile ways of working. Okay. Any questions this far? Okay, right, so let's go to the next slide then. So as I said, the best way to deal with uncertainty is to iterate, to reduce uncertainty about what the product should be, work in short iteration. Short iteration means short cycles. So you need to work in short cycles, one to four weeks maximum. And show, ideally give working software to users every week. So users can at least see and test. And you can test the market as well doing this. If you can see, there's not much demand in your software in the first two, three months, and you have not delivered all the big list of features, you can quickly pivot and you can change your software. You can change the direction of your company. Even some smaller companies, those lean startups, like if you follow Silicon Valley, you will see people, they have started with one idea and then they ended up with something totally different because based on the feedback, based on the market, based on the usage of that software, they realize that this is not their niche market. They have to build something brand new. So that's what happens when you're working in iterative and incremental model. So that was just to give the context, like why we are using Agile and how Agile can help us. So now if you go towards uh, where Agile came from, so basically back in 2001, 17, uh, let's say developers or software engineers. So these guys were people who are actually coding um, technical people. So they came together uh, in a ski resort in America and they were thinking about how we can make something which can help all the industry in terms of the values, because these are all the seasoned practitioners. They have worked in the industry for so long. They learned like without having values or principles, no matter how hard you will work, you will not be able to deliver results. So I think someone mentioned earlier as well, so that Scrum is not just about, Scrum or Agile is not just about delivering softwares. It's more than that. You need to insult the values and the principles in your teams before you can go actually into development phase. So now let's look on what comes under Agile Umbrella. So as you might have heard me saying Scrum. So Scrum is one of the framework within the umbrella. If you call Agile as an umbrella, like covering all these methods and framework, you will find um, there are lots of methods or frameworks available within Agile Umbrella. But what I would like you to see is on the right side, which can tell you 
which methods or frameworks are more adaptive with fewer rules. Because if you are a small organization and you want to test something, you don't want to go with lots of rules where it will be difficult for you to cross correct yourself. So you will start with something which is very simple, very easy to understand, very minimal rules and principles. If you see the, the one which is very minimal uh, rules is Kanban. So there are only a few rules in Kanban comparing to Scrum. Scrum is nine as well. So it is also very less comparing to other methods available. So Scrum itself is a framework. Anyone knows what is the difference between a framework or a method? Any ideas? No right and wrong? Feel free to say. What is the difference between a framework or a method? Uh, I think it's a framework. A subs method is a subset of the framework. Maybe. Okay, so you're saying method is a subset of framework. Okay. Anyone else would like to share their opinion? Feel free to say there is no right and wrong. So I will always correct or I will always tell you what is right. Okay, so the key difference between a framework or method is framework is beautifully empty, usually like Scrum. It doesn't tell you the details, like if something goes wrong, how to correct. It doesn't give you all the prescription. Like if you have this kind of problem, take this medicine. Whereas in methods or methodologies you see, um, like if I give you example of SAFE, which is another scaling framework, um, in my view is very prescriptive because it gives you um, information on every stage. Like if this is not working, do this. If this doesn't do, do this. It is very, very detailed. Whereas in Scrum, it is only three roles, five events, three artifacts, very, very simple. And what you do within that framework is up to you. You can use some of the, let's say, crystal methods. You can use some of extreme programming methods. You can use, uh, let's say, user stories we captured from extreme programming SP. Even the, our Scrum board, which some of you might have heard, uh, which we use to visualize the things is, is basically from Kanban. It used to call Kanban board. Um, so what I'm trying to tell you is when you will uncover what Scrum is. So Scrum is a very beautiful framework, which is very simple, very easy to understand, but difficult to master. Difficult to master means because while you're working in that framework, you need to continuously improving, you know, to continuously updating yourself. And it's very hard to master it because you are always in the mindset of learning and improving and you can course correct yourself very easily. Okay, so this is a, one of the key difference between a framework or a method. So now let's look on those four agile values. So as I mentioned earlier in 2001, these 17 guys came together and, and that's what they came up with. They came up with agile manifesto. So agile manifesto has four values. And at the back of this manifesto, there are 12 principles, okay? So these four values are, are still same today. Like it's nearly 19 years now. This is still same. If you look on this four values, what it's telling us, let's say in the previous world, like while you're working in waterfall or you're working in your tr traditional ways of working, where you're taking lots of requirements, all these different things, customer negotiations, so what Agile Manifesto tells us, if you see value on these items on the right side, for example, if you see value in process and tool, you will value more the individuals and interactions, like talking to people, talking to customers, talking to stakeholders. So if you value comprehensive documentation where you would like to write specification documents, where you like to write detailed plans, then you should value more the customer collaboration part. Because at the end of the day, you need to deliver some value to the customer. So is it better to have a comprehensive documentation or customer collaboration where customer is onboarded with you from the start of the journey and he is up to date at every stage of the project life cycle. Similar to this contract negotiation, if you see the, there is a value in contract ne negotiation, then you should start valuing working software because every customer who is paying money at the end of the day, they will be looking for a working software. But if you are delivering that working software in increments, like let's say every second or third sprint, you are delivering something which is working. So it is more beneficial than having a contract negotiation. Then you can 
actually showcase your work. You can showcase them what has been done. And the customer will build a trust in yourself. The, the fourth one is following a plan. We are not saying don't follow plan. Yes, create a plan. Everyone needs a plan. Create a plan, but have agility in that plan. Try to make it flexible. Like if you have to change to response, like market is changing so fast. We are into 21st century and things are changing so fast, so rapidly, especially with the COVID, you might have seen the companies who were very stubborn, like in terms of their ways of working, they have changed as well. Um, Scrum Alliance was one of the company who said certified Scrum Master or certified product owner certification must be in person because there is a reason because they value individual and interactions. So they, within physical courses, individual and interactions, they have more, um, let's say communication. But now with COVID, everything has changed. So they have to revert and they thought about, okay, shall we stop everything for a few months or shall we continue in the online version? So they decided to change, respond to the change. Although they had a plan, but they decided to respond to the change and they said, okay, now all our courses are online. So people can attend from anywhere in the world. It might change when the COVID will be over. They might go and they say, okay, now we are, our courses are going back to the physical courses. But this is a very good example, like follow the plan, but have flexibility to respond to the change. Any questions this far? So as I mentioned earlier, manifesto gives you four values, but at the back of those four values, there are 12 principles. If being an individual, being an organization, being someone who wants to bring agility in your organization, being someone who wants to deliver some software, being someone who wants to create your own software company, being someone who is an entrepreneur, you need to look very carefully into these 12 principles. These 12 principles will help you to get your desired results. I will not read all of them in details, but what I can do is I have highlighted some key elements out of these 12 principles. If you see the first one, satisfy the customer. Most of us working in the industry where we are developing something for the customer. So at the end of the day, we want our customers to be happy. What this principle tell us is our highest priority is to satisfy customers throughout continuous delivery. How we can make a continuous delivery? I have given you example earlier with the cone of uncertainty. So if you work in a traditional project, you will go at the end and there are more chances to fail. You need to deliver that value content continuously. And if I look on the other one is technical excellence, which is number nine. Continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility, right? So technical excellence comes from where? Technical excellence comes from your team's feedback. So feedback happens on a regular basis in your sprints, in your agile ways of working, and you have more chances to improve your technical excellence because at the end of every sprint, team is sitting together and they're reviewing their process and they're looking at how we can make it better. So continuous attention, they're giving continuous attention every week, every day. Then 11th is the best architecture requirements and design emerging from self-organization, from self-organizing team. So mo the problem with most of us is we, let's say, are sometimes we think we are very senior developer or we are very senior in one architect or we are solution architect and I can run an organization and I can hire people and those people will work to as I want. What happens then is we destroy their creativity, we destroy their innovation. We don't hire people to tell them what to do. It's a very famous quote. We, I think it's from Steve Jobs. So we hire people so they can tell us what to do. And it will, not, it will not come if you don't give them the environment where they can grow, where they can self-organize. So once the teams are self-organizing, then they can give you best architecture. They can give you better requirements, better designs, then they will be motivated as well. And parallel to this, if you look at the five, number fifth principle, build projects around motivated individuals. Again, this is, it's very much linked to 11 as well. If you don't give them space, trust, so they can self-organize, they will not be motivated. So motivation is not something you can say to them and they will be motivated tomorrow. You need to provide them the environment. It requires lots of attention to detail. You need to give them the space. You need to provide them psychological safety. Like whatever they are doing is I'm there to support you, not to blame you. But how we can come out of this blame culture is doing iteratively. So when we are working iteratively in sprints as a team, 
we cannot blame one person. It's a failure for whole team if something doesn't work. Even if it's a failure for whole team in first sprint, we are not losing much money. We will realize that this project or this piece of work or this functionality will not going to work. And we try to course correct and we try to change the direction. Okay. So if you want to go into details, you can go Google Agile Manifesto. It will give you four values and 12 principles. You can go and have a look and you can read the details as well. So I will not go into too much details here. Um, so now to back this up, I read a very nice definition from Ahmed Sitke, who is the founder of IC Agile. IC Agile is one of the other organizations similar to Scrum Alliance. Uh, they provide certifications. So this guy is PhD and based on his research, what he came up with, I really love this definition because some people say Agile is framework, Agile is methodology, Agile is this and that. This guy sums up everything. He says Agile is a mindset defined by values. So when we talk about values, the values we just looked, the four values. So Agile is a mindset defined by values guided by principles. So the principle we just have seen, 12 principles. A mindset defined by values guided by principles and manifested through many different practices. So this is many, why is missing here? So, and manifested through many different practices. So practices can be Scrum, Safe, Kanban, Extreme Programming, Lean, Scrum at Scale. So all these are practices. So the key thing is to have Agile mindset and look on those values and see how your 12 principles can help you to deliver those values. Okay, so now let's try to see how Agile mindset can help you and what we do in our Agile ways of working, how it is linked to our Agile mindset. If you see in this example on this screen, if you see this um, as an onion, in the middle of this onion, we have a mindset. Okay, so mindset is driving all this agility. So the outer onion is values and principles, then you have practices and framework, then you have tools and processes. Okay. So if you see doing agile is only part of it. It's not whole. The whole meaning of doing agile is being agile. You need to be in the state of being agile. Okay. Doing agile can come with different tools, practices, and meetings and events, you can do agile, but being agile is the hard part, okay? So now let's do an activity. Um, let me share one thing. So in our Zoom chat, I'm going to share a link. And I would like to invite all of you to this link. So there's a link in the Zoom chat. It's a Jamboard link. Click on this link and you will land here, the screen I'm sharing. Okay. I've seen one person has joined. So click on this link and land on this page. So while you're on this page, there's a very simple functionality on the left side. It is giving you sticky notes. So when you click on a sticky note, it, it will show you something like this, which you can see on my screen as well. So it gives you a pop-up to write something. Okay. I have listed one number one attached to being agile. I have listed number two attached to doing agile. So if by mistake you have moved something, you can do control Z, so that's fine. Um, so what I would like you to do is looking at this pyramid, so where you have values, principles, and practices, using this sticky note, like for example, if I use a sticky note, and if I think being agile is one part of the pyramid, I will write one, and I will stick one, let's say here. And then I can resize this as well. I can make it smaller so other people can put their stickies as well. So you can resize your sticky. You can put one if you think out of these three uh, pyramid pillars, if you think being agile as one out of these, you can put your one against to there, 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 wherever you like. If you think 
out of these three. Doing agile is number two. Then you can write number two and you can put number two wherever you want. So your key is one is being agile and two is doing agile. So some of you already have started very good, so you can carry on. So once you have added, yeah, drag it down to the pillar or the pyramid value where you think is more relevant. You can drag it down, you can resize it as well. So based on our discussion we just had, what you think, what is being agile and what is doing agile? Okay. You can grab them, you can drag them, you can resize them. Nice, very good. Carry on. If any of you missed the link, the miss the link is in the chat. Okay. Yeah. So some of you left your number twos. Try to bring them closer to the uh, keyword where you think it is more relevant. Okay, nice. I think we have a very clear picture. So um, most of you are saying being agile is where the value and principles are. And most of you are saying doing agile is by the practices. So let's go back to our presentation. So you're right. So being agile, if you see, as I mentioned earlier, don't just jump into picking up frameworks or practices or methods. Before starting your agile journey, you need to work on the principles and the values. You need to be in the state of being agile. Okay, you need to have the agile mindset. So this is a source from Jimmy Butler book, Pursuing Timeless Agility. If you're interested, you can read the book as well. So doing agile is just the tip. So doing agile is just the practices. So without having those founding blocks, you will not find success. So now let's dig deeper into agile value proposition, okay? So in on this slide, they have four different parameters. One is visibility. When we are comparing agile project to a traditional project, let's say, let me try to annotate as well so you can see where I am. So let's say if you are at the start here, you are starting the project. There is some visibility in traditional project. When you're going, let's say it's a six month long project. When you are here in the traditional project, there is no feedback from the customer. Customer has not seen what you are developing and no visibility, no visibility. But when you're going towards the end of your six month project, then you will show customer, okay, this is what we have developed. Comparing to this in Agile, every sprint we are showing customer, but either it's a one week sprint, two week sprint or three week or four week, we are showing customer what we are developing. So it's very, very visible. And in contrast to this, if you look at the business value in the traditional project, client or customer is spending a lot of money, but they will not get the value until it reaches to this stage. They will only get the value when something is going live in the market. Whereas in Agile, we are saying we're working in increments in our sprints and we are delivering value regularly, continuously. We are delivering value might be here, value is delivered here, value is delivered here, value is delivered here. We are pushing things live to the market 
We are not waiting for the full fledged project to go live. <clears throat> we are in making things live as they develop. Let's say we have some basic features available, we make it live. So this is how we bring the business value. And now if you look at the adaptability, in traditional projects you're working and maybe something has changed in the market and you are at this stage, you are let's say quarter into your project and you have to change something. Now your software development organization, they will say, okay, we have uh, spent so much time into this. So changing this will be very difficult. Okay, here is the change request form. Please fill that form and tell us what you want to adopt. And then we will try to adopt accordingly and it will go down and down. Whereas in agile ways of working, if the customer wants to adopt something at the end of the sprint, they can tell us, they can adopt here, they can adopt here. It, and instead of reaching there, they might reach here, but at least they will get what they wanted. They will get the adopted changes. If you see the risk in traditional project and agile project, when you are starting project, there's a big risk as we have seen, and it was very evident from the cone of uncertainty, any project you are starting, there's a big risk at the start. So while you're working in the project, let's say you're working in traditional project and you're going towards the end and that's where your risk is reducing. In agile project, although we are saying there is a risk, but every delivery we are doing, every sprint delivery we are doing, we are reducing risk. So our risk is going down like this here, this way. It is going down like this way and we are limiting risk in sprints rather than looking at the full project. We are basically dealing with the sprints, we are dealing with iterations, we are managing those risks in those sprints. That's why the risk is low in terms of larger or complex projects, complex adaptive projects. That's where your scrum comes in. Okay, so let me clear this one. So now let's see um, which frameworks are most popular in terms of the delivering value to the customer or increments. So based on a 13 annual report of State of Agile by version one, um, this is not up to date, I think the latest one is available now. So this is from the last year. So as per that, it is showing across the globe. Scrum is adopted 54%. And if you see the comparison with other frameworks or method, it's is, is very, very high. So 54% for Scrum, hybrid. Hybrid means some organization, they might have chosen Scrum and Kanban. They mix something to, together and they call it Scrumban, which is fine. You need to see what works well in your context. If you think you can pick some elements from Scrum, you can sprinkle something and it will help you in giving you results. You can make um, a hybrid model like uh, Spotify. Spotify is a perfect example of a hybrid model where they are using Scrum. They are doing all the rituals, like the events and things, but they have called it a Spotify model. In Spotify model, they created chapters. Um, if some of you are not familiar with what I'm talking about, you can Google um, Agile Spotify model, and you will see the details, like how they created their own model. But the idea is same. The founding blocks are based on your Agile manifesto and the 12 principles. So you need to see and you need to look very carefully on those 12 principles and the values and then see how you can improve. If you think you can improve and you can deliver continuous value to the customer and you can uh, make great products without Scrum, do that. You don't need Scrum. So you need to see what works well in your context. Okay. So now we're going slightly deeper into what Scrum is because some of you might not be exposed to this framework as of yet. So as I mentioned earlier, this is one of the framework available within your Agile Bigger Umbrella. And it's widely used, you have seen from the research as well. So it's 50%, um, let's say, adaptability rate across the globe. So Scrum is very lightweight, simple to understand, difficult to master. And I told you why it's difficult to master. And simple to understand means there are not so many rules and regulations, prescriptions. It's very simple. You have three roles, you have five events, you have three artifacts. So we can have a quick look on those artifacts, 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 oh, sorry, artifacts, artifacts, artifacts. Ah, sometimes tongue are slipping. So to artifacts, if I ask you, what is your general understanding about artifact? What do you think? What, when I say artifact, without looking at here, 
without looking at that artifact is a product backlog, artifact is print backlog, artifact is product increment. Without looking at these three things, if I ask you what comes into your mind when you talk about artifacts, anyone? What is an artifact in a journal term? What you guys use artifact for in your ways of working? You need to unmute yourself and speak up. If you don't want to speak up, you can write in the chat and Hamid will help me to read it out. Uh, artifact is basically a build. Let's say if you are building an Android app, then this APK is your artifact. Okay, okay. So that's from the technical side, that's your understanding, that's very good. So it's, it's good to know. Anyone else? Feel free guys, there is no right and wrong. Uh, if you are telling something which is wrong, it doesn't matter. We are just trying to understand and helping each other to understand better. <clears throat> okay. Yep. Yeah. Someone wants to say something? Right, okay, let me tell you then. So in archeology, span I mean, most of you have heard the word archeology. span So in archeology, span the word artifact is something which is created by humans. So that becomes your artifact. So similar to this in Scrum, we have three artifacts. So when we're talking about humans, so these artifacts have different meanings. So when we talk about product backlog, product backlog means it's a big container of wish list with all the requirements. So this is also made by human and that human name is product owner. So product owner is the person who is responsible for that artifact. And he's the person who, is who has created this artifact. If you talk about sprint backlog, so sprint backlog is, if you compare this to a traditional way of working, it's like a small plan for a small project. So out of this big product backlog, big project, you have to do a sprint backlog, which you said our team will work on in one week, two week or three weeks sprint. So this is this becomes your sprint backlog, something which is in working. And and the human who or the humans who has created this artifact is your development team. So your development team looks onto your product backlog with the product owner in the planning session and they say, okay, this is what we are going to pick and based on the understanding from product owner, they create this artifact. It's called sprint artifact or sprint backlog. The third one is your product increment. So again, the humans which are involved in the product increment is your development team. The development team are the people who will be working on those given requirements in the given time box activity and they will produce something which is shippable. So the definition of product increment is something shippable which has the right quality to go live, okay? So this is your Scrum framework, very, very simple, okay? And as I said earlier, intentionally it is incomplete, intentionally or beautifully empty, within which you can use variety of techniques, processes, tools to make it better. But the key thing is Scrum exists in its own entirety, means you need to follow at least those events. So when we say events, there are different events. We have five events in Scrum. So one is, is your sprint. Then you have your planning session where you go into and you plan your work. Then you have your daily Scrum where you do your daily uh, meetings. And then where you go into your review session where you bring your customers and stakeholders and you show them. So that's where we were talking about like you need to bring your customers and they can get give you continuous feedback. So this is the event for your customer stakeholders in the review session they can come and give feedback and then the other last um, event the fifth one is called your retrospective and this is mainly to improve the process and people so you will look into your process and tools and people and you will try to improve it as part of your um, increment or as part of your upcoming sprints so this is your scrum defined in less than let's say five or six minutes so three roles, three artifacts, five events. Okay. And just to go slightly deeper into those roles so you can better understand then you can relate into your organizations who are your product owners, who can be your scrum master or if you are someone 
who have tendency to help organization, tendency to help people, tendency to help your business leaders, then this might be you. And then who can be your development team? So this is just an overview to give you uh, what it means. So the product owner is someone who maximizes the value, who is someone representing your business, who understands the full picture of the business, who is very much aligned with the vision. He or she knows what is the vision of the organization. And according to the vision of the organization, he or she creates the value in terms of the product backlog. He or she also prioritizes the item based on the business value and very, very transparent across the organization. On the other side, if you see the Scrum Master, the Scrum Master is usually someone who has the expert knowledge about the Scrum framework. So who knows how to help team in terms of, let's say, coaching the team, in terms of guiding the team, in terms of bringing them back into where they were as part of our sprint goal. So there is another thing called sprint goal. So as most of you know that without goal, if you go towards something, you will not be able to reach. So you need to define some goals. So when we are working in Scrum in our time box sprints, as part of our planning session, we create sprint goals. Okay, and the team's responsibility is to deliver a sprint goal at the end. So Scrum master role is to make sure team is aligned to the sprint goal. And if team needs some help, it can be technical help in terms of hardware failure, it can be impediments or something which team cannot resolve themselves then they will highlight or they will raise in, in let's say in the daily meeting or in the scrum meeting, then your scrum master will be able to help you. So scrum master is someone who has some influence in the organization, who can be sometimes political as well, because that person needs to build up some links to resolve those issues and problems for the team. So this person needs to be resourceful in terms of agile or scrum knowledge. So he can guide the product owner, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Product Owner, you need to write this product backlog in this way. That's how you create the product backlog, that's how you write the user story. So he or she can guide product owner as well and help development team and the wider organization. So wider organization means if you're new to this ways of working and if you're part of a larger organization, it's a big organization, you need to create a small bubble in your organization within your team and within that bubble, you need to start experimenting these things. But being a scrum master, you should be looking at the wider part of the organization. So once you think your team has successfully implemented Scrum within that specific part of the organization, then you will look forward and you will try to help the organization towards agility as well. Okay, so that's where your agile mindset comes in. And the development team, so what we are saying is the typical size of development team is between three to nine. And there is a very scientific reason behind having a development team size three to nine I will tell you later if may I ask you, so some of you are already part of development industry. Some of you might be working as a developer. What is the typical size you have seen in your organization for development teams? Anyone? Or what is the development team size in your organization? You can unmute yourself. Yeah. yeah. In, in your team, in your uh, organization, you have five to six people? Yes. Okay, anyone else? We from other location. Okay, then you have, um, let's say, teams in the remote locations as well. Okay. Yes. Anyone else would like to share? Yes, yes. Uh, five to six people uh, um, send some projects. Uh, it's more than six people as well, but few uh, uh, role are shared like uh, quality insurance, uh, like a uh, front-end developer and designer are shared. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, it's, it, it's different in different organizations, but what I have seen in my limited experience in Pakistan, <clears throat> uh, usually the team size is quite large. Let's say if, the, if this is a product-oriented organization or software company, they have like up to 30, 40 developers, and they're working on different, different things parallel. Sometimes same person is working on multiple projects, same person is working on production defects and all this. So the drawback is more team members, more communication lines. So based on Dr. Jeff Sutherland research and his decades of research into scrum ways of working, he came up with this 
idea of three to nine, because if you have less than three people in the team, then it means your team will not have the right skills available within that two to three people, or two to one to two people to complete a certain task. But on the contrary, if in your teams you have more than nine people, let's say you have 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 people working on the project, it means there are more communications lines. It will get very, very difficult to communicate information and knowledge from each other. And it will be very difficult to manage. So that's why they came up with this number three to nine. And then based on research recently done by Harvard University from the United States, they came up and they said, five is the optimal number. So if you have five, that's the best team size. But what scrum guides tell us is three to nine. So so three should be minimum, nine should be maximum. Okay. So as part of development team attribute, there are a couple of listed here. There are lots of them, but the key ones are listed here. So scrum development teams are cross functional, self-organizing, accountable as a team. <clears throat> So cross functional means they have all the right skills available within the team so they they can get the job done self organizing is that as i mentioned earlier your teams should be self organized they should not be waiting for instruction from the senior leadership and the best architecture emerges from the self organizing team we have seen this very very evidently from <clears throat> the principles this the 11 principle so best architecture and requirement emerges from self organizing teams so we talk about self organizing team a lot but did we ever thought about like how we can make our teams become self-organized or how self-organization looks like or self-managed teams? So here are some indication for you guys. So if you want your teams to be become self-organized, you need to do some work. If you are the product owner or if you are the business person or if you are someone who is leading the organization, you are, let's say the managing director or CEO or someone, you need to make sure your vision and goals are clear. You need to have clear goals and vision, which is visible to the whole team. Then team knows what they're going to work on. If they're developing some product, they can see if that product is in line with the vision of the company or the goals of the company. So you need to have your visions and goal very clear. Team agreements and collaboration. If it's a new team, you may be a good idea to bring the team together in a room and ask them to create our team agreements, norms, like maybe Someone say, okay, I will work from home from this time to this time. Other person will say, I need to do this. I need to um, work in a place which is very quieter place. Um, I don't like noisy people. So it can also help self-organization. And it is very evident from the example I am going to give you from a UK hockey team, so UK women's hockey team. So UK women's hockey, teams was, hockey team was very average team and they hardly won any Olympic medals. So they, they had a very good coach previously who left and after that the team was going downhill they were looking like how we are going to improve our team how we are going to get to that ladder of getting gold medals so they looked into different different areas there's a terminology called marginal gains which is quite famous in uk it has been used in cycling as well uh, it has been used in rugby as well so marginal gains means you will look into small, tiny, tiny details and see how those things can help your teams to be grow and motivated. So what they did was, uh, let's say it, it depends on the mood as well. So for example, you have a team of people, team of people, they are not resources. They are not table and chair who you will assign something and it will be there. We are human beings. We are working in the software industry or development teams. Everyone have their own mood, everyone have their own nature, their own um, thinking style. And someone might be in a different zone. Maybe they have something happening in the home. They don't want to be very vocal or they don't want to have a laugh at you. They want to have a humor. They want to sit quiet. So similar thing happened with these people, uh, the women hockey team. What they observed was uh, sometime when they're going in the bus towards the stadium, um, because it's a big event, big match, so some people would like to stay quieter. Some people like to listen to the music so they can keep themselves motivated. And what they observed was when those people were sitting in the bus, sometimes there are some people who are very quiet and next to them, there are some people who are making, um, who are listening some music and the music is coming out of their headphones. 
which is irritating the other person. So what happens was the other person who is quiet person, maybe he wants to stay in that zone. When he reaches to the stadium, he or she reaches to the stadium, they might be upset because they didn't get that peace they were looking for. So what they did was <clears throat> they worked with the team and they see which are the people who usually become quieter in the tense situation or which are the people who like to listen to music. They figured out and they list, they created a list for those people. They said, okay, so these, these people will sit together because they like to listen to music. These, these people will sit together because they would like to stay quieter. These, these people will use a uh, changing room on the left side because they are more noisy and unorganized people. These people will use the changing room on the right side because those people are very tidy and neat people. Because some people get really frustrated if their things are not tidy and this stays in their head when they're going in the match. So these small, tiny, tiny details help them and the team achieve very good results. And the next Olympics, they were able to secure medals. So I have just given you a small example, but there are lots of examples and lots of hard work put into that team which gives them those marginal gains to achieve that results. So what I'm trying to tell you is when you're working with your teams, you need to have all these things looked at, being a leader, being someone who's working with the team, and you need to give them the space, give them the environment where they can grow, where they can self-organize, where they can have more collaborative environment. So then the other thing is skill development and training. You need to have some sort of skill development training available. So your people are multi, talented. You are not depending on one core skill. If one person is having one core skill, train on other skills as well. We we'll look into how those people will look like. We usually call them T-shaped people. They have core skill in one direction, um, in horizontal, and they have multiple skills in um, horizontal. We can look into that. Coaching and mentoring, you need to coach them. If they're junior people, you need to coach them and mentor them. Transparency. So transparency should be led from the senior management. Transparency, transparency should be led from the leadership team and the respect should be given. Commitment, empower them and give them the trust. So if you do all these things which are highlighted in these six boxes, then you will able to see the teams will be self-organizing. Then you will see the great products. Then you will see the motivated teams. So these sort of things you need to work with the teams to bring your teams to the high performing teams. And those teams are the teams who can deliver twice the work in half the time. There's a very nice book by Dr. Jeff Sutherland. Um, it's called Twice the Work in half the, line, half the Time. You can Google as well. So if you get a chance, you can take an um, e-version or audible version. You, you, it's, it's a very good book. So now we, we looked into Agile Manifesto and Agile Values. And then we looked into why should we be doing Agile? Um, what is the founding blocks for Scrum framework? Within Scrum, there are some values as well. So as I mentioned earlier, so if you don't have the basis right, you will not be able to deliver. You will not be able to get your teams uh, to performing at their best. Within Scrum, you have also five values. So there's a the value of courage, focus, commitment, respect, and openness. So there are five key values. And every value is interlinked directly with what you're doing in your Scrum and sprints. So let's say if you're working in a sprint on a time box project, and your team is stuck, they are, your team member is stuck, he or she is not able to uh, write something, not able to code something and need help. But he or she knows if he or she asks, then people will start judging he or she. And they will say, oh, this person doesn't know how to write. Oh, uh, I need to tell this person now how to write. So what happens? Then this person will lose respect, lose commitment, lose focus. In contrast to this, if you respect that person and say, okay, maybe you value, maybe they need some help and you try to help them with openness, it will drive them towards focus and they will give you full commitment. And next time they will have courage to say, yes, I need help. So you need to provide them this safe environment and it will only come by insulting these values into your team. So that's why these values are quite key. So these are called your Scrum values. And if you look into how you can build this Scrum house, a beautiful empty house, uh, where you can do much of innovation, creativity, um, this innovation and creativity will not come without empiricism. Anyone knows what is empiricism means or what may it means in, by empirical process control? Any ideas, right or wrong? Okay, so empiricism 
means knowledge is derived from experience and evidence. That's the founding block for Scrum. It means when we are working in our sprints, we are doing some control experiments sometimes, and we are learning and we are building our knowledge from that experience with some evidence as well. So this is your empirical process control, okay? So this is your foundation. This is your founding block of Scrum, empirical process control. And then within that empirical process control, we have three pillars. Those pillars are called transparency, inspection, and adoption. And you can imagine if you don't have the pillars in a house, what will happen to the house? It will collapse, right? So transparency, if you have transparency from the senior management towards your uh, junior teams, teams will start trusting you more. If you have transparency to your customers, your customer will start trusting you more. They will give you more work in the future. They will think, yes, you are the people who are transparent. You are not hiding stuff from us. You are not over quoting us. You are not having hidden charges. So you need to be transparent. Then inspection. Inspection means whatever we are doing on a daily basis in our projects. <clears throat> Sorry. We need to be always looking for room for improvement, inspect into what we are doing. So those five events in Scrum, your sprint, your daily meeting, your planning session, your retrospective, your review, all these five events give you opportunity to inspect into what you are doing. Either it's your planning, you are inspecting into the requirements and what you're going to deliver. If you're reviewing with the customer, you are inspecting into the review phase. Sorry, one second. <coughs> you're inspecting into the review phase. And then when you're in your retrospective, you're inspecting how well your team performed and how you can help your team. And then you do adaptation. So that's the third pillar. You inspect into all these areas and then you adapt. So once you do all these inspection, adaption, and you bring transparency, then it builds trust. Then it builds trust in your team. Then your teams will start trusting you. Okay. So that's why these three pillars are killer. It needs to be there. Without those pillars, you can kill the creativity. You can you will kill the innovation in the team. So you have empirical process control at their base level, at the founding block, then these pillars, transparency, inspection, adoption. So once you have these things done, then you can put the roof of Scrum on top. Then you can say, yes, now we are ready. Now our teams can deliver twice the work. <coughs> um, Hamid, how are we are looking with the time? Uh, so we, uh, we have uh, half an hour left. Okay, perfect. Good. So here we go. So you have transparency, inspection, and adoption. So it's called TIA. So when we look into our sprint, so what is a sprint? So we talked about sprint is a time box activity. It's the heart of your <clears throat> scrum. It's usually one month or less. So one month means it's 30 days or less, basically. You can have one week, two weeks, three weeks. So in my experience, I have done two week sprints, three week sprints. I have not done one week sprint but I have seen other people doing one week sprint where they are working in a very competitive environment like uh, retail, uh, where are delivering stuff, goods online. Then one week sprint will be very useful because they need to be at the edge with the competitors. They need to deliver very fast. They need to make changes very fast. That's where your one week sprints come very handy because you're continuously working, inspecting, adapting, inspecting, adapting, delivering continuous feedback loop. So that's where it comes very handy. So in your context, in your environment, your organization, you need to see what time box works better for you. Either it's one week, two weeks, three weeks, or four weeks. Okay. So now let's see how Agile can help in lean startup or what it what is it meant by lean startup. Any of you have ever heard the word lean startup? Some of you are working in the startup, what a startup looks like, how you guys work. Anyone would like to share the knowledge or share the opinion? So the, there are three key things about lean startups. Build, measure, and learn. These are the basis for your lean startup. Build, measure, and learn. If you're building, you're not measuring, you're not learning, then you will not able to pivot. 
So pivot means you can change direction. You know, when I start this session, I showed you the video of the bull and the cheetah. That's the reason I have shown you the video. If your organization is a bull, they will not able to measure and learn and rechange their direction. So you need to be a cheetah. So the lean startups, the startups who are killing all these giants are in this kind of state where they are creating an idea, they build some prototype and they test it, they measure and they see the data, if it's working or not working, they learn from the data, either they improve, if it's not improvable, they kill that product, they create new product. Okay. This is the idea. That's why the startups who, who can change fast, who can pivot fast, who can change their direction fast, who can change their vision if the product is not working, they are giving very good results. Okay. So pivot is the key. So sometimes we are very much locked up into the vision. Most of the organization, they say, we have created this organizational vision and we need to follow this, which is very good. We need to have a vision. We need to follow the vision. But if your vision is not delivering value, being a leader, you need to see if this vision is correct. If this vision will deliver value for our customers and for ourselves, then you might have to change the vision as well. Okay. There's a very famous quotation by a guy called Steve Blank. So Steve Blank is a serial uh, entrepreneur. He has created lots of startups. His advice is get out of the building. Get out of the building means get out, do something, build something and learn from it. So that's where the web get out of the building comes in. <clears throat> There's a very nice video I'm going to share with you by this guy. Have a look. It's loading. So one of the great things about getting out of the building is when I first came up with the idea. You guys can hear? Is audible? The video was audible? Yes, we can hear. Okay, perfect. And then try to teach it. I'd say, get out of the building to my students. And then I'd find them milling around the parking lot. <laughs> and then the next thing I say, no, 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 in front of customers. And so the next thing I find is they were like taking their demo and saying, so what do you think? Do you want to buy it? And that's not really customer discovery. That's actually called sales. Customer discovery is not sales. Customer discovery is a lot of listening, not a lot of talking. But the first question, if you're a young entrepreneur, is I don't know anybody. How can I figure out who to talk to? I can't believe that nowadays with LinkedIn, in Facebook, you cannot find a hundred people to have a conversation with. And when you start having a conversation with one, whatever else you're asking, you ask two final questions. Who else should I be talking to? And because you're a pushy entrepreneur, when they give you those names, you say, do you mind if I sit here as you email them introducing me? And then the second thing that I always suggest you end the customer discovery interview with is, what should I have really asked you? And sometimes that gets into another half hour of, oh, too bad you're not doing X or Y, because that's really my problem. But you know, here's what we're really worried about. So the customer discovery is actually quite easy once you realize you don't need to get the world's best first interview. In fact, it's the sum of these data points over time. It's not just you're going to be doing one and you want to call on the highest level of the organization. In fact, you actually never want to call on the highest level of the organization because you're not selling yet. You don't know enough. You want to, in fact, understand enough about the customer, their problem, how they're solving it today, and whether your solution even is in the planet of what they're thinking. Okay, so... All right. So what you learned from that video? Question to all of you. So the key message in the video is get out of the building. So, so you have customers available. You can go to them, you can ask questions, you have different techniques available. You can also see uh, there is a very nice video on YouTube called Innovation Lab. So when you Google Innovation Lab, you will see what they actually did. So they actually 
set in the shop and they were creating software while they were interacting with the customer. So they were asking, they were in the um, optical shop in the innovation lab and people were coming and they were looking on the glasses and they were saying, oh, this frame doesn't suit me, this, this, this. And they were getting live feedback from the customers. So that's what it means by get out of the building and get the feedback from the customer, get what the customer need and test your idea and see if that's something customer really want, then you will get a very good results. So in terms of um, in our model, uh, how Scrum can help you in terms of your lean startup. So when we're talking about lean startup, there are two different ways to validate your hypothesis. So basically lean startup is based on hypothesis. Like my, I have a hypothesis that this product or this thing will work, but then I need to test it. So in order to test, there are two different things. One is called MVP. Anyone heard MVP? Yeah, yes, minimal viable product. Perfect, yes, minimal viable product. Exactly. So before creating a full-fledged product, before spending too much money, um, the best way is to create a minimal viable product, MVP, which has limited features. You can create that product, you can bring that product to market, you can test the market, you can learn from it, you can measure from it, you have the data to validate your hypothesis. If your hypothesis is valid, you can go and build version one. This is the one way. Other way is pivot, as I mentioned earlier. So pivot means change direction. So you build something uh, and you went to market very fast and you see it is not working and it is not in line with your company's vision as well. You pivot, you change the vision of the company because you're a startup, you can do that. You can, you can change direction. You can build something new, okay? So that's where Scrum can help you. So Scrum can help you to iterate and deliver your product or services in incremental manner. So you can work towards your MVP. You can define some high level features based on your customer input. And in this example, let's say you have decided to go with two week sprints and you said seven sprints. So within 14 weeks, you can create your fully fledged working minimal viable product and you can test it. So what happens in the framework? So this is a more detailed picture of the Scrum framework. So at the very first stage, you do user story mapping. Even before user story mapping, you, you go and you do some customer interviews. As part of your customer interviews, you go in to create some persona. Anyone heard the term user personas? Yes, exactly. It's a basically uh, based on the user, like uh, uh, the, the person who interact the system. Exactly. So you create those uh, dummy profiles of users who will be your target audience. You can define your, their democratics. You can define their age. You can define their um, ways of working. You can define their habits. You can define all these criteria, which will give you like how your actual user will look like who is your target market. So you create user personas and based on your user personas, you create your requirement. And then out of those requirements, you create your story. Story means you create your manageable user stories, like small pieces of work. And then as part of this framework, then you go into your refinement where you bring your development team together with the product owner, the person who has the business knowledge, you business, the businessman or the product owner explains the detailed development being asked question. And as part of this meeting, sometimes they have to prioritize, deprioritize some of the requirements. And then sometimes they have to give them sizes in terms of t-shirt sizes or any other sizing technique they would like to use. There are some story point sizing as well. And high level analysis can be done at the same time. So the role of your business analyst can also be incorporated into this he can become a part of your scrum team. He can do the analysis as, as part of your sprint and he can do the design as well. So there are different, different ways to do it. So the idea is as back of your backlog refinement, you have some ready items available. Then you go in this continuous cycle of sprints. You do your planning, you go your daily standups, you have your sprint review, demo, retrospective. And on the right side, what it's showing you is like some visual representation of your project. Like you can use any tools like Trello, Jira, even you can use an Excel file if you don't have those tools. You can create a column for your backlog means what is your wish list, what you want to work on. To do means what you're going to pick up as part of your sprint, which can become your sprint backlog. Then 
bugs or development testing. So these are different columns. You can redefine these columns. There is no hard and fast rule in these columns. The, the three columns are usually to do in progress and done. So this is a very bare minimum. So this is your um, Scrum framework defined very quickly without going into much detail, like how these different events will happen and at what stages these events will happen. So the last event, if you can see, is the retrospective, which is normally similar to what you do in your previous world, like lesson learned. But this one is more oriented with the process and the people, and you try to improve it. So any questions this far? Anyone? Uh, yes, uh, I have a question related to the uh, when we are actually designing the sprint and once we start the sprint and uh, during the sprint, actually the team face the few issues related to which is like we need uh, some blockage and need R&D. Then how we can estimate that uh, the sprint? Obviously, we lock that sprint uh, either it is by week or two week. So how we can uh, during the sprint, we change the uh, the plan or uh, we need to be wait for the till at the end of the sprint. Yeah, you, you should not wait till the end of the sprint. So that's why you have this uh, daily scrum meetings as well. So daily scrum meetings will give you the opportunity to inspect into your daily plan. You can force correct as well. So in your scenario, if something is not working, so that's where I said in your refinement session, you will look into your full requirements and the product owner will break into smaller user stories or smaller tasks or smaller requirements, and then he prioritize. And he made them those ready with all the right details. So let's say in your sprint, you have uh, created some backlog of user stories or requirements, and one requirement is blocked, which your team is not able to do for some reason, which is out of the control of the team. Then there are some ready item available in the backlog. So this mechanism or technique is called pull. The team can pull the work from the backlog rather than push. In traditional world, our project managers, um, who, are, who I have great respect with, um, for and those guys used to push. Okay, you are stuck with this. Okay, do this. I'm giving you this work you need to deliver without asking the team if they can deliver or not. But the beauty of this framework is, team pulls the work based on their capacity. So then they can pull. To answer your question, if something is not working and with the consensus of your product owner, team can pull more work and the other work can go back into the product backlog until your <clears throat> dependencies or impediments or blockers are removed, <clears throat> if they are unremovable. Any other questions? Yes, there are retrospective meeting. Yes. What is the question regarding retrospective? What happens inside the meeting? So your line is very breaking. So what I understood is any ex examples, what happens in retrospective? Right. Uh, that's what the question is. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so I will give you one example. So let's say your team worked on um, some deliverables as part of your sprint. And as part of normal team, while when you are working in your development team, sometimes you have some roadblocks. Sometimes there are some process issues. Maybe uh, let's say team are not aligned on test automation. Team is not aligned on unit testing. And <clears throat> sometimes the tool issue, the server is very slow or hard drive is very small. Memory is very low. Or some people uh, don't have the right knowledge. They are not able to code properly. Or sometimes, um, you can say the teams who are working on it, they don't have the clear idea what is going on in terms of sprint goals. So when you go into your retrospective, you bring the team in a safe environment where Scrum also create that environment and assure them that what happens in this environment. For example, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So everyone can have the trust in the Scrum Master and the team members so they can be more open. So again, going back to the values of Scrum being openness, so in order to bring the openness, you need to give them respect. You need to bring them to focus. So you bring the data into the sprint. So as part of the sprint, um, Scrum Master might be keeping notes what is going well, what is not going well in his head or somewhere. Team members will be keeping some notes, visual notes in their heads as well. When they're in the retrospective session, we will come in the session and Scrum Master might start and saying, okay, so let's start from the positive side. So what happened well? What do you think went well in the session? Team members will say, yes, the team collaboration went very well. This went very well. We achieved our um, sprint goal. 
and then say, okay, uh, what you think didn't go well in the sprint of two weeks? Then team will start opening up with saying, okay, all the communication was good, but I think we missed a few of the details because I was not able to read the email. So then you start writing those details up and then um, you having all these improvements listed and then out of, let's say there are 15 or 16 improvements out of those improvements. Um, humanly, you cannot work on all these improvement in the next sprint or next few weeks, but being a scrum master or working in the process, you need to make sure that your team is improving. Your team is continuously improving on those areas. So what you can do is you can ask the team, okay, out of these 12 or 15 items, what you think are more affecting you? What you think having high priority, you can do something dot voting or something um, where you can have a consensus from the team and you select let's say three or four top priority items. So those items will become your actionable items and Scrum Master then goes back or, and with the consensus of the team, sometimes you need to create a backlog item like a user story so team can work on it. So that's how you work within your sprint review or sprint retrospectives. And that's normally what happens in the retrospective and that's how it can help you to inspect, adapt, and improve. I hope I answer your question. Yeah, thank you. Right, so if there are no further questions, we can go to our next slide, which is kindly we have already covered. So as I mentioned earlier, before even creating your product backlog or wish list or requirements, you need to do some user interviews to understand what actually the market is, what product you're going to build. If it's something which user will have interest, you will have custom base or not. And based on that, you create your personas or user journeys where you go into the details of each behavior or actor or person, demographic and all these things. And then you come to this product backlog where you create high level requirements. So usually your product owner captures high level requirement based on discussions with the customer client or the senior management. Sometimes you have internal stakeholders like your CEOs or like your um, um, managing directors. So product owner will get all these requirements. So that's where your product backlog is created. And if you see on the left side of the screen, you have product backlog item. It can be different items. Um, if you're working for a ticketing environment, you will have some item for a search engine. You will have item for a ticketing booking hotel booking, flights booking. So all these items are listed as part of your user interviews or user personas and journeys. So then this backlog will be used for your sprint planning and reviews. So that's where is your creation of product backlog comes from. So in terms of advantages, we have looked into um, how Agile can help you. We looked into what is Agile, what is Agile mindset. We looked into how Agile can help the startups. We looked into if you want to become an entrepreneur, what skills you need to have, uh, what values you need to follow. If you want to get uh, high productive teams, what you need to do, we looked all in, all in, all, we looked into all these different ways and the advantages are limitless. But here I have highlighted some of the advantages like continuous feedback from the customer, short iteration, like you have regular intervals um, for your feedback loops with your sprints. Um, easy change handling, you can change, you have ready items, you can change with the consensus of your product owner. Um, you can manage customer expectation, customer changing requirements as well, predictable rhythm. So once your team is in the rhythm of delivering in these sprints, then you can predict as well. So let's say if your team is delivering five, six user story, five, six user story or story points, then after seven or eight sprints, you will be, have a very good rhythm for the team and you can predict in the future. If you have projects, you can say, okay, this project will take X amount of time. There's a different way. There are different techniques available for estimation, different techniques available for prioritization. So this is not the right place to go into the details. So this course was mainly aligned towards like how our new entrepreneurs or startup leaders or people who are working in software industry or any industry have some great ideas and they want to test their ideas, how they can test their ideas, how they can work together, how they can make teams happier and what are the advantages they will have. They will have less issues. They will have more happy customers. So these are all the end results. And I have shown you before um, how the T-shaped people look like. So when you're forming your teams, so this is additional slide I have um, added. Um, to show you like how different people looks like. So typically in previous world, we used to have I shape people where someone is saying, I am, let's say .NET developer and that person only knows .NET and nothing else. So this is your I shape people. When you say we have T shape people and that's where we 
usually love to have T-shaped people in the Scrum teams because those people are the people who have growth mindset. Growth mindset means they have agile mindset. They are ready to learn. Um, they might have one core skill in .NET development, but they have some other secondary skills as well. If you see an example of designer on the right side in this blue um, man, you will see designer has one core competency in analysis, but he has secondary competencies, testing and development, similar to development. He has core competency in development, but he knows how to analyze, how to test. So these are the people who are good um, members of, who can be good member of your scrum teams. And then you have M shape and E shape. So there are different dynamics to these different shapes. So just to bring it back to the context of uh, cross-functional teams, which was one of the attributes for your Scrum teams. So um, that's all from my side. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask the questions. And um, Hamid, if you want to say something, you can say as well. Sorry, I have a question. Yeah. How should the points be? Sorry, Hamid. Your line is very bad. You said something about how uh, story points is measured. Yes. Okay. So if if your line is bad or if I'm not able to hear, try to chat. Uh, put your question in the chat as well, so Hamid or someone else will be able to read out the questions to me as well. So, uh, so me measure. When you say measure, what comes into your mind? You want to measure the productivity of the team. You want to measure how well your team is performing. You want to measure what your team is going to deliver, what is in your head when you talk about measurement of the team? Um, I think uh, uh, Osama is trying to like ask for how do you define the complexity of a user story and based on the effort that the, uh, the team will require or the, or the number of developers that will be working on that user story. So how does that uh, pointing works? Okay, so that, that's a different topic. It's about estimation, but I would like to answer this one here quickly. We humans are usually very bad at estimation and we sometimes need some relation so we can relate our estimates. So if I tell you this one bottle here is one story points. And if I ask you how many story points for five bottles like this, what would be your answer? Five. Five. So you can relate, right? You can relate to this bottle size, shape, complexity, dynamics, everything. And you can say, okay, <clears throat> it's almost same complexity, same uncertainty, same risk. So when you are estimating, regardless of what technique you use, there are three key things you need to remember. Three key things which can affect your estimation is uncertainty, risk, complexity. These three things can affect your estimates. And that's where our estimates go wrong. That's where our man hour estimates are usually wrong. And that's where you see teams are scared of giving man hours. If a project manager asks someone, tell me how many hours it will take, Although it will take, let's say, 30 hours, but the developer in his head is very scared because he knows there are some unknown, some uncertainty, some surprises. He will say, oh, it will take me 60 hours, right? So he's bulking up all these estimates in his head. That's where the fear comes in. The beauty of Scrum is in Scrum, we don't use man hours. We sometimes use rel relative sizing. We use story points. So that's where story points comes in. So story points are mainly based on your uncertainty your, um, uh, let's say, complexity and your um, risk. So, so all these things together, as a team, they say, okay, we think the story point for this is five. So now you have a base mark, benchmark. So, so that's where your story points comes in. So as I mentioned earlier, so your team needs to work together for at least six, seven or eight sprints to know exactly each other, to know exactly what is the definition of these story points rather than man hours. And then they can tell, okay, our, as a team, our collective velocity. So then it becomes velocity. So if your team is delivering five user story equals to 50 story points, then you can say our team is burning 50 story points. Our team velocity is 50 story points. So that's where your story points comes in and it becomes very handy. And after seven or eight sprints, 
you can tell easily your team velocity is 80 story points and based on that you can predict any project and that's where predictability comes in so scrum also helps you to predict things in the future in terms of your project predictability uh, estimation timelines okay i hope i have answered your question any other questions guys So if, awesome. I guess we are done. Okay. So if there are no other questions, uh, I will share with you if any of you are interested in exploring further how Agile or different ways of working will help you. I will share with um, Hamid, um, who is uh, CEO of uh, Shadow Technology and who is leading this initiative. I will share with him what sort of different uh, trainings available and how it can help you. And I have a special, let's say, place for Pakistan in my heart and all these trainings or certifications um, I have very very low price for Pakistan and I, I don't even charge what other people are charging so I can share with Hamid and Hamid can share with you in the email as well sure sir sure so okay uh, I would like to conclude it here uh, so bundle of thanks to Sajid Shahan Ilyas for sparing his precious time for all of us uh, myself as a startup founder has really learned a lot today uh, about the agile and lean startup things and I hope that the other guys also have enjoyed and learned a lot. So uh, I would like to thank few people. Uh, I would like to thank especially Sarah Noor, our only female participant in this session. So Sarah, really thank you uh, for being here and making this uh, a little balanced uh, session. Uh, we at Sharu, we always uh, aim to make our sessions gender balanced. Uh, but today, I guess because of few internet issues and maybe the timing of session, we have few like mm -hmm. less female participants. So thank you very much, Sarah, for being here. And then uh, we have Gulzaman Ilyas with us. So he's a very senior guy and uh, I have worked with him and I have a lot of regard for him. So thank you very much. And lastly, yes, once again, a bundle of thanks to Sajish and Ilyas for bringing this idea and sharing this idea with me and uh, sparing his precious time and uh, letting us all learn from the Mastero himself. So I, I would really love to be in touch and I will be looking forward to the details you will be sharing with me as you mentioned. So a bundle of thanks from my side and from all of us at Shadow Technologies. Thank you. Thank you guys. So stay hungry, stay agile. All the best. Bye. All the best. Take care, guys. Thank you.